have to start our service. Good morning, First Unity Church of St. Louis. I'm Mary Tuminello, and I am so pleased to be able to welcome you today. We are so glad that you have chosen to be here. We know that you have brought something unique and special to our spiritual community, and it is our heartfelt prayer that you will take something away from our service that will fill your soul's needs. I know it's sad we can't be here physically right now, but whether you're watching for the first time, we want to welcome you, or you're a longtime member of First Unity, we know absolutely we are one in spirit. Our videography today is Kathy Boyd. Thank you, Kathy, for all the service and talent you have brought to this church since the March of last year, not this year. You also organized and led the videography program, which included Patricia and Dennis Reese and Carol Bullock. We are so grateful for our sound engineer and technical advisor, Jeremiah Bashir. We also want to thank the chaplain that is reading Daily Word today, Lynn Mark, and all the chaplains that have kept this program going. And also the prayer circle that is led by Pam Seeger. They have held a heart vast space of spiritual for at least over 16 years. And now we want to thank our LUT and ministerial candidate, Anne Harnapy, for she will be reading the closing. I have a few announcements for you. Some great news. We are so happy that we're going to announce that on March 20th, Father's Day, we will be reopening. If you are fully vaccinated, you are welcome to come without masks or social distancing. If you don't want to do that and you don't feel comfortable with it, you're welcome to wear a mask. And we will have a special section where you can be six feet apart. Also remember, the service will be recorded and put on YouTube. Kind of mixed feelings, a reminder that Dean Wigard is last Sunday, is next Sunday the 27th. We will have a farewell celebration. Um, we will be after service on Sunday. If you have not gotten the information or you have some questions, please call the office and talk to Sarah or just leave a message. Our other announcement is, as on July 4th, we are hosting Ann Hart, a Peace Mentor, Reverend Becky Whitehead from Unity of Omaha. If you're in town, and would you please consider coming so we can support Ann, and there will be a lunch afterwards. Another announcement, kind of a surprise, July 11th, Ann Harderby will begin a discussion group at 9 o'clock on Sunday before the service. The book she is going to be using is This Life is Yours, Discover Your Power, Claim Your Wholeness, and Heal Your Life. Written by Linda Martella Whitset and her daughter Alicia Whitset. And finally, Ann Harderby will be doing our speaking, our lesson today, because Reverend Ann had a commitment. Ann's title is Torchbearer to Light the Way. At this time, I would like to invite Lynn Mark to read the daily word and to pray with us. Lynn? Good morning. My name is Lynn Mark, and I am your daily word chaplain today. That is my honor. And the daily word for today, Sunday, June 13th, 2021, is world peace. Peace shared between people spreads throughout the world. I contribute to world peace when I join in spirit with all people who dedicate themselves to expressing divine love, united in the belief that God is within everyone. 
I affirm the divinity of humankind and honor each person as a unique expression of God. I recognize and release any unkind thoughts or feelings toward any person or group of people. I respect all others and seek to learn more about customs and beliefs that are unfamiliar to me. This is as I grow in the spirit of kinship. I believe a warm, friendly attitude communicates my intentions as effectively as my words. I smile easily and extend myself to others in a spirit of friendship. I remain mindful that as peace flowers between individuals, peace grows in the world. <clears throat> From Micah chapter 4, verse 3, Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Let's pray. Precious Spirit, as we hear these words about peace, help us to remember that peace really begins within each one of us. Remind us that we are all capable of creating an environment of trust and respect for one another. Remind us, too, that showing kindness to another is an act filled with grace. And so it is. Amen. At the age of 42, in the year 1887, a Midwestern wife and mother, using spiritual methods, healed herself of tuberculosis. The word spread about her amazing healing, and she then helped others suffering from physical and psychological maladies reach a new level of spiritual understanding in their own lives and in the process heal themselves. This remarkable woman's name was Myrtle Fillmore. Unlike most of the women of her day, she was not much concerned with worldly matters. She preferred instead to pursue the education of her mind and spirit. She was a pioneer in Christian metaphysics. Her successful use of affirmative prayer to heal herself also inspired her husband Charles to pursue metaphysical thought as well. Today, as we become more familiar with the mother of unity, as Myrtle is often called, I'll be using these sources. The Story of Unity by James Dillett Freeman, Torchbearer to Light the Way, the Life of Myrtle Fillmore by Neil Wally and Myrtle Fillmore, Mother of Unity by Thomas E. Witherspoon. Mary Caroline Page was born on August 6, 1845 in Pagetown, Ohio, the little girl affectionately called Myrtle Lee by her father and that funny red-headed girl by most of the townspeople was the eighth of nine children born to Marcus and Lucy Page. Marcus and Lucy were deeply religious. Myrtle, however, never became a member of her parents' church. She appreciated the services in the church she attended, but even at a very young age, she found much of its doctrine unacceptable in her own life. For example, she didn't understand how her loving and caring mother to believe in a God that punished his creation. Myrtle was passionately in love with God and with nature as a child, and she spent many happy hours by herself outside. Her relationship with nature was very satisfying for her, and she realized later in life that she was feeling and responding in her youth to the omnipresence of God. The abundant life of God poured out and into her from everywhere. Myrtle was afflicted at an early age with a disease which doctors diagnosed as tuberculosis. So she grew up with members of the family telling her, you're delicate, you must be protected, don't overdo it. But Myrtle did not let this belief interfere with her life. 
She was an eager learner and always wanted to read material that was more advanced than her years, or books that educators of the time said were not suitable for young girls. She could never understand why her parents also felt those books were unsuited for her active mind. She'd secretly borrow her brother's books when he wasn't looking and steal away to her secluded place by a stream and read them. As a teenager, Myrtle read every book in the Page household. She had no time for boys and even less time for girls who did have time for them. When Myrtle completed high school, the Civil War was underway. And a short time after the war, Myrtle's father, Marcus Page, died, followed just a few days later by her brother Thomas. And with her father's death, the responsibilities for helping maintain the home fell largely to Myrtle and her two remaining brothers. Myrtle decided to take a job during this time and moved for a brief time to Columbus, Ohio, where she was employed as a writer with a newspaper. In 1867, she took another important step in her education when she enrolled in the literary course for ladies at Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. Her studies lasted only a year because women were not eligible for the regular four-year college programs. Upon graduation, she was licensed as a teacher. She returned to Pagetown, where she joined her mother and her brother David and his family, and together they made plans to go west. Myrtle had secured a position as a teacher in Clinton, Missouri. She loved Clinton, and she was much loved there, but the shadow of tuberculosis continued to haunt her. She became very weak from the disease, and the doctors in Clinton advised her to leave Missouri, where dampness and winter's cold complicated her symptoms. It was recommended that she go to Denison, Texas, known at that time as a resort for consumptive patients. So it was that in the mid-1870s, in her late 20s, Myrtle Page left Clinton and moved toward better health, little suspecting that her future husband and spiritual co-worker also waited for her there. Since the doctors forbid her to continue teaching, Myrtle busied herself with activities at a local church in Denison, did a little private tutoring, and joined the Denison Literary Club, where she met the man of her life, Charles Fairweather. He and Myrtle were attracted to each other immediately, although Charles was much more confident that marriage was in their future. Charles first, first saw Myrtle when she was delivering an original reading at a literary club meeting. When he looked at her, something within him said, there's your wife, Charles. He always thought he had chosen her, but years later she confided to him that it had only seemed so. The woman always does the choosing, she told him, even though it only be to insist upon the man living up to her high ideals. But, she added, you were splendid, dear, or I wouldn't have chosen you. As a young girl, Myrtle thought interest in male companionship would detract from her happy pursuit of knowledge in the form of books and from her love of God and nature. But she immediately recognized that Charles could enhance her enjoyment of these things, for he shared so many of her interests. And in a short time, the two were exchanging books and ideas. And since they were also interested in scientific matters, they often went out into the countryside searching for fossils. Myrtle moved back to Clinton, Missouri to resume her teaching career after about a year in Denison. But she and Charles continued corresponding while they were apart. And in the spring of 1881, Charles took a trip back to Clinton, and he and Myrtle married. By the time they moved to Kansas City, Missouri in 1884, 
Charles was a very successful real estate salesman. He and Myrtle also had two sons by then, and a third son was born in Kansas City. But shortly after their move, the real estate boom collapsed and Myrtle's health was declining again. A period of deep depression now settled in the Fillmore household. At that time, Myrtle had great faith in medicine and tried all sorts of medical remedies for her health. Again, her doctors told her if she remained in Kansas City, she'd probably have only a short time to live. There was nothing they could do for her. In the spring of 1886, Charles and Myrtle went to hear Dr. E. B. Weeks, who had been recommended by a friend. Their friend had been studying this new thought stuff and felt that Myrtle might get help from it for her physical condition. They didn't know much about the topic, but they were willing to try anything. Charles left the lecture feeling no different than when he had gone in, but Myrtle left with a new, liberating conviction that transformed her thinking. One statement repeated itself over and over in her mind. I am a child of God, and therefore I do not inherit sickness. In one hour, Myrtle Fillmore's whole outlook toward herself and her life had been changed. The old belief that she was an invalid disappeared. This thought, I am a child of God, and therefore I do not inherit sickness, worked in her until it made her whole. And the thought did not let go of her until she and her husband, who was inspired by her affirmative prayer, had founded a faith that reached around the world. Convinced by her subsequent health transformation, Myrtle helped friends realize the same benefits. Charles, whose scientific mind demanded a thorough investigation, read everything available on the subject of metaphysics. He couldn't deny the changes in his life and eventually experienced a series of spiritual revelations in the form of dreams. In April 1889, the Fillmore's published Modern Thought, the first of many writings. The magazine's subtitle set the tone for the early years of their movement. It read, devoted to the spiritualization of humanity from an independent standpoint. In the earliest days of the unity movement, it was Myrtle's staying power that kept it going. She led the way in almost all things affecting unity. And as the 1890s progressed, so did Myrtle's theology. Through her association with New Thought writers and practitioners, and through her reading of the Gospels in the New Testament, and the religious literature from both East and West, Myrtle and Charles developed a teaching they called Practical Christianity. The filmer saw their work as applying the truths taught in the Bible, especially the teachings of Jesus in a very practical way. Myrtle Fillmore saw her life's purpose as being a torchbearer to light the way for all sincere, true followers of the master metaphysician, Christ Jesus. The urge to teach spiritual truths grew out of her belief that life was a school for spiritual learning. In this school of experience, she wrote, we are drilled until we are proficient in our work. Spiritual awakening was the goal, an objective that would be achieved as our God-given faculties and powers unfolded. We could graduate from the school of life when we understood and applied the principles of the truth of being. The principles of the truth of being can be understood best by focusing on Myrtle's conception of the nature and workings of God. One of the primary truths of being, according to Myrtle, is that the universe and God are one. Expressions about how God is manifested in the universe are in all of her letters. Here's an example of what she wrote. 
The best that we have in spiritual teaching says that God is omnipresent spirit in all, through all, above all. We are convinced that there is but one mind, one life, one substance, one power. She evolved this belief into the idea that human beings could discover God by turning within themselves. This was central to her teaching. She explained, God and his heaven are right here now in your own consciousness, awaiting recognition and unfoldment. Myrtle never accepted the idea that God was a supreme being existing separate from humankind. It was wrong, she believed, to think of God as a being who is apart from you and who rewards you according to his whim or according to some particular merit. She saw God and humankind participating as co-workers in the work of the world. Often, she elaborated on this point by using terms such as co-creators, partner, and God's executive in letters she wrote. As a partner with God, men and women assumed responsibility for developing themselves spiritually. It is for us to go within and develop our souls, she said, and bring our innate resources, capabilities, and possibilities into expression. Jesus was also important, Myrtle believed, because more than any other human, he demonstrated the divinity that lay within all men and women. Jesus helped humanity, she wrote, not by giving them temporal wealth, material things, but by showing them how to find their own innate divinity and demonstrate the law of good for themselves so that they have permanent, lasting health, happiness, and prosperity. Jesus, through his conscious recognition and inner realization of oneness with God, developed what Myrtle characterized as the Christ mind, or Christ consciousness. She taught that men and women who, like Jesus, can dedicate themselves to a daily practice of keeping their mind and heart their vision and emotion fixed on God will develop their soul and find Christ in you, your hope of glory. According to Myrtle, Jesus exercised the 12 powers, the divine qualities that Reverend Jan recently did a series about in the course of his ministry on earth. But she also believed that Jesus had no greater inherent powers than we have. Therefore, his accomplishments were within our reach. She based this belief on what Jesus said in John 14, 12. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these shall he do. She asserted that the Creator put within each soul all the qualities, ideals, and capabilities that will enable us to accomplish the mighty things that Christ Jesus demonstrated if we, too, develop and use these abilities. In the course of her 40-year involvement with the Unity Movement, Myrtle nurtured and guided it from a handful of workers in 1890 to a staff of almost 500 when she made her transition in 1931. This included a prayer ministry that answered by letter over 600,000 prayer requests annually, and a spiritual magazine publishing enterprise that served 594,000 subscribers with seven different publications. At the time of her passing, several hundred centers existed around the world, many with leaders and teachers trained by her. Myrtle and Charles Fillmore worked together to build unity. It was Myrtle Fillmore who first accepted the idea of divine healing. It was Charles Fillmore who edited the first magazine. It was Myrtle Fillmore who led the people 
in meditation and prayer, it was Charles Fillmore who made speeches and wrote books. They worked together as heart and head worked together. And from their united efforts grew the movement that is unity. Myrtle herself summarized best her life's legacy when she wrote, when we forget our own desires and devote ourselves to doing what God would have done this moment and constantly, we shall find that there is no limit to the strength we have and things we can do. And so it is. You are the very life of God 
in expression. You are one with eternal, unending life. You were created perfect. You were meant for perfection. There is no condition of mind or body that is impossible for we who were created by infinity itself have our being in infinite life. The secret of life is in the sound. The mystery of life is hidden within our being. Christ is our life. Christ is the healing power within us. Christ is the light force of our being. We pause now for a few moments in silence to practice the experience of the Christ presence within and know that in this oneness with this spark of divinity, we are whole. The impossible is always possible because we are more than we see. We are more than our thoughts, actions, or feelings. We are more than our life experiences. We are spiritual beings created for life. We are here to love. We are here to serve. We are here to be God's expression on this earth. And so it is, and so we joyously allow it to be.